everyone. So we'll go ahead and start it on chapter 10. This is our patient assessment. This will be a two-part uh, chapter. So basically, I'll say this, and I said this for a long time, right? What separates the men from the boys and the girls from the women is the ability to assess patients. This is really difficult. Um, I think the practice of medicine is really the practice of assessment, right? A, a monkey can put in orders to, in, in like, you know, do a good chunk of a physician's work. It's very predictable. Uh, once you figure out what the diagnosis is, that's easy. It's algorithmic, right? Like we know what the treatment is for diseases that's written down on paper, but, and, and anyone can follow that algorithm, that treatment recommendation. But what's really difficult is to figure out what's the diagnosis and <clears throat> how are we so certain it's that diagnosis and not another? And, and, and that's really difficult. And the majority of this is done through patient assessment. And um, patient assessment is really difficult. And I think the practice of medicine really comes down to practice of patient assessment and history taking and being – and I think that's what makes good EMTs and good paramedics and good physicians and good nurses is how good are you at assessing a patient and figuring out what's wrong with them and then consequently fixing it. But if you can't figure out what's wrong with them or appropriately figure out what's wrong with them or quickly figure out what's wrong with them, you can't really fit, you can't fix it. You can't treat it. So all that to be said, this is difficult. And um, <clears throat> I hate to drop this bias in your head, but this is probably one of my not favorite chapters to teach because it's frustrating to me as an educator to try to teach to you something that happens over a lifetime, right? Like how do I teach you to be a good person? You know what I'm saying? Like you learn how to do that over a lifetime. And so, you know, my two hour lecture over patient assessment is going to lay some foundation and there's, there's some good information in here for sure, but it doesn't really teach you how to assess patients. That's done in the field to a degree. It's done in the lab. We'll do this in the classroom quite a bit, but this is done through experience through years and years and years and years of doing this. And, um, I've been doing this almost 10 years now and I, you know, I'm obviously in medical school and, uh, I'm learning so much about patient assessment from other physicians um, just seeing like how they approach the problems and how they do physical exam and history taking and just, to, if this is something that you'll work on for the rest of your life, the rest of your career. So realize that when I blow through some of this material today, um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to write it off as not important. It is important, but, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to teach and it's, it's hard to learn in a PowerPoint. This is done in hands-on, um, by seeing actual patients or sometimes in a simulation, like in a, in a lab. But just be aware of that, okay? So the pa patient assessment process, we start off with scene size up. We're going to talk about each of these. Our primary survey, history taking, our secondary assessment, we reassess, right? Um, and really, the thing about patient assessment that I think makes us successful is you have to be systematic, right? So I see this a lot. Thankfully, I have experience assessing patients as a paramedic. But I see this a lot with other medical students and, and, and really EMT and paramedic students is they just throw shit at the wall and hope something sticks in their assessment, right? So they're not very systematic in how they how they do their physical exam or how they take their history or, or how they assess patients. Uh, <clears throat> and they just throw a bunch of darts and hope something sticks. And I think that, you know, that works sometimes. Like, every, you know, the blind squirrel gets a nut every now and then. And so sometimes that can be helpful. But again, if we, this what separates the men from the boys is those who can do really good uh, patient assessment over and over again, okay, and not occasionally get a nut, you know. So uh, you have to be systematic with this, and I think that that's something that this book does a good job on um, is to encourage you to be systematic, right, to go through the sample, to go through the OPQRST, to know your DCAT BTLS, right, to know those things that, to where you can work your way through those um, and knowing, okay, I have to do a scene size up that then takes me to a primary survey, and then I can take history, and then a secondary assessment, and then a reassessment, right? And if we follow those steps, we tend to, to be a little more systematic, okay? So uh, this is just some general uh, vocabulary, right? But a sign is objective condition that you observe, right? So it would be a sign that someone is vomiting, right? It's a sign that someone's pooping blood. It is a sign that someone's coughing, right? Like I can see that. It's objective. Like I, I can see that, that you're pooping blood, right? We're vomiting blood. Um, that's a sign. It's something that I can see at, uh, I can see of my patient. Okay. As opposed to a symptom is subjective. And remember subjective symptom means something that was said or something, uh, some, yeah, let's just say it was said. Okay. So it's, I'm nauseated. I'm in pain. I feel dizzy. I don't feel good, right? Those are all symptoms, right? And so I can't usually 
verify a symptom very well. Okay, as, as a paramedic or you know a nurse or a physician or an EMT, you can't really prove someone's in pain or not, right? Because it's a subjective complaint. And so I can't really prove someone's nauseated or not, right? That's a subjective complaint. Or I can't really prove that someone's sad or not, right? Like it, that's subjective. It's the way they feel. It's something that they said to me. So keep that in mind. Um, that it, And so what happens is sometimes on an exam, they'll list off something and say, oh, Patients complaining of nausea, is this a, a sign or symptom, right? It's a symptom. Patients, you observe the patient vomiting, is this a sign or symptom? It's a sign, right? That you're seeing it. You, it's, it's subjective. So, and a chief complaint was the reason EMS was called. So, I walk into a house. Hi, my name's Hunter. I'm a paramedic with the Park County Hospital District EMS. What's going on today, right? That's my, that's my intro, okay? Project confidence, command presence, right? But I like to say, introduce myself, what's going on today? And if they say, well, four months ago I fell and I broke my hip and, you know, I've been feeling a little sad. And I'll, I'll politely, like, no, no, no. What caused you to activate the 911 system today? Oh, I'm short of breath. Great. So then I know that's their chief complaint. Their chief complaint is like a single phrase, I'm short of breath. I have chest pain. I have whatever, okay? I have a gunshot wound to my abdomen, right? Whatever the complaint is, okay? And so sometimes I've found that I have to really narrow in a patient and say, what's going on today? Now, this is really kind of an emergency medicine thing. We don't do this as much in clinical medicine because clinical medicine can be over months, like, in a, like in an outpatient. But as EMTs, we almost always do emergency medicine. So it's you, you really have to direct the patient what's going on today. That's their chief complaint, okay? Now... Uh, and, and their chief complaint could be a sign or symptom, right? So they could tell me their chief, oh, well, hey, my name's Hunter, I'm from Medical Park County Hospital District. What's going on today? I'm nauseated. Okay, well, that's a symptom, but that's still a chief complaint. Same thing. Introduce myself. What's going on today? Oh, I'm pooping blood. Well, that's a sign. Okay, I look in the toilet, there's, there's blood in there. Okay, you know what I'm saying? So it can be a sign or a symptom, or it could be both. I'm nauseated and vomiting. Okay, that's a sign and a symptom. Now, um, this is, again, critical thinking skills, right? You can't, I've, I'm learning you can't teach manners and professionalism to people. And quite frankly, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more convinced you can't teach critical thinking to people either, or it's very difficult. So, um, and, I, and I'm saying this because of medical students, not EMT students. And so critical thinking skills are developed over a lifetime. And again, that's why I think patient assessment takes a lifetime to perfect. Or to even try to perfect. I don't think we ever get perfect at this. And so we, with our critical thinking skills, we use this thing that I love called intuition, right? And intuition is essentially gathering information and past knowledge and making an idea, right? Making an, a thought. And so we gather information, we evaluate information, we synthesize the information, we develop an idea of patients' problems, and we formulate a field impression, right? What's a field impression? This is their attempt at calling it a diagnosis, right? Sometimes you get afraid of the D word in EMS, which I think it's silly. Uh, it's a diagnosis, but sometimes they'll call it a differential diagnosis or a, uh, a field impression. So field impression means diagnosis. And so basically, we do the same thing as, as a physician or as a paramedic or a nurse or an ENT, right? We gather our past knowledge and training. We observe and synthesize all this information and all this data coming in through our senses. And we make an idea. We're like, oh, this idea sure does sound like Kawasaki's disease or uh, acute coronary syndrome or a uh, hemorrhagic stroke or whatever, you know? So, and that's how we come up with a diagnosis. And, and it, like I said, in this case, they call it a field impression. So we start with our scene size up. So this really, I will say that I start forming my scene size up in route to the call, right? So I'm figuring out, like I'm looking at the CAD, the, the computer notes, and they're saying, okay, the patient is a, you know, 27-year-old female who's vomiting, okay? Party too sick person. Okay, well, I'm responding, and this is not a nice area of town, and it's actually in a mobile home park, and, you know, I've, I've seen some really bad things in this particular neighborhood, and, oh, wow, we've been to this house seven times in the last 10 days. Okay, so this is a frequent flyer, right? So I'm already starting to gather. Okay, uh, in the notes, I can see that we've sent three engine companies to this house because the patient weighs 800 pounds, right? So or whatever the scenario is, so I'm already gathering information. And in fact, I'll discuss this with my partner and say, Oh, okay, hey, you know, if, if she can walk, let's have her walk to the ambulance or, yeah, let's just bring the stretcher up to the stairs and see if we can get her to walk down the stairs or whatever. So we're already trying to figure out, like, how are we going to treat this patient? How are we going to move them? What's the plan? You know, oh, hey, it's raining really hard. Let's go to the Azel. It's the closest hospital or whatever. Yeah, we're, we're discussing these things, and this really does happen. 
And so, you know, you, you want to have situational awareness. I'm always astounded by the lack of situational awareness of people, but uh, we can't be naive, right? There are people in the world that want to cause us harm. And so you need to be situationally aware for your safety, one. And two, just general situational awareness, right? You have four people in the house complaining of vomiting, right, on Thanksgiving Day. Well, they might have just ate some bad deviled eggs, right, or some bad mayonnaise, right? So we got to use our situational awareness. What is going on around us, right? And we have to consider a variety of factors. Uh, uh, combine the information from dispatch with your observation of the scene, okay? Now, you have to ensure scene safety. So consider traffic safety, wear a traffic vest, look for hazards, down power lines with, with water, fire, smoke, dogs, animals. Man, I've been chased by some dogs before. That's very scary. Uh, and you have to protect the patient and the bystander. But whose safety is first? It's yours and your partner's. Your safety is first, okay? So remember, we don't go rushing in to go rapidly extricate the patient with power lines down on top of it while it's raining, okay? We just don't do that, okay? And again, I've said this before, we have to delete our uh, firefighter mentality when taking these exams. You might do that as a firefighter, but you remember, when you take this exam, you're just little old Hunter Harbold as an EMT paramedic or whatever, going in to go do so. so you cannot have your firefighter brain cap on when you're doing this so a lot of times we'll try to determine what the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness is okay and the moi or the moa so the moi is the, how the patient became injured so in this particular case it looks like a, a collision with a, a t-bone collision that's what this they're showing you here this is a t-bone collision so i have to think for the patient sitting that just got whacked into the door they're definitely going to be hurt more than this person there's a lot more metal between this guy, whoops, between the, the front of this vehicle and the guy sitting back here versus this guy right here who's hurting, okay? So we have to look at those things. And the mechanism of injury for the guy that had a frontal wing collision, right, is very different. He had an engine block, a crumple zone, a windshield, airbags, and a frontal seatbelt that all protected him. Versus this guy, he had a door and a side curtain airbag. That's it. That's all that was protecting him. So he is more likely, more likely hurt than, than this guy, typically. So we use this to help us, right? So like front it, like a head-on collision, massive amounts of energy that is stopping very, very quickly. So it gets transferred into the human body and people get killed and jacked up that way. Rollover, right? We have torsional uh, energy, right? That's twisting on the body and twisting them. If they're not secure, they're going to get ejected probably. You know, so like there's all these different, uh, and, and this isn't just car wrecks, right? This could be the guy that was hanging Christmas lights and fell 10 feet off the roof onto his head. Luckily, his neck broke his fall, right? Or, you know, maybe this is the grandma that slipped and fell in the bathroom, right? So it was a ground level fall onto a, onto a tile floor. Or, you know, there's a lot of different injuries that this can occur. So MOI, we see this a lot and we think a lot of car wrecks, but it's not exclusive to that, right? It, it's, it's, it's virtually all forms of trauma, falls, stabbings, gunshot wounds, vehicles, explosions, burns, right? That's the mechanism of injury. And then the nature of illness is how did they get sick? Um, so again, if they're vomiting, you know, that's their nature of their illness. Their, their, their illness is vomiting. So that's, that's their nature of illness, okay? And we figure that out in the scene size up. Now, blunt trauma, this is a, the trauma that occurs over a broad area. My favorite example is a baseball bat to the chest or the abdomen, right? It's blunt, okay? The skin is not broken. Baseball bats tend to not break the skin, okay? Versus a penetrating trauma, this is a gunshot wound or like a, a, a stab wound or, you know, a, a piece of rebar or a vehicle has penetrated the skin. So the skin gets broken. So penetration, right? You're penetrating the skin, really. That's penetrating trauma, okay? So the nature of the illness, I talked about this, right? It could be seizure, heart attack, diabetic, poisoning, right? This best described uh, by the patient's chief complaint in medical history. So we might get called to a priority one unconscious person, but we get there and the patient's daughter says, oh, she's a type one diabetic and she didn't eat last night. Oh, okay. It's, it's hypoglycemia probably, right? Or we could have the same call, priority one unconscious person, and we get there and they're like, Oh, you know, she was complaining of the worst headache of her life last night. Now she's unconscious. Okay, it's probably a stroke, right? Hemorrhagic stroke. So we can use that clinically to guide us, okay? So talk with the patient, talk with the family, talk with the bystanders. Don't push off, um, especially family, uh, the family, uh, and even bystanders. Like sometimes they have really valuable information. No, don't get me wrong. There's no, no, uh, there's nosy neighbor syndrome, right? Where the nosy neighbors will come out and just get in your business and they can be quickly dismissed. But Try to extrapolate what you can from these people and get some good information because sometimes they're really helpful. So we want to take standard precautions. Remember, standard precautions assume that all patients pose a risk to infection. This is pretty much why we wear gloves with virtually every patient. 
We treat all blood as contagious blood. Uh, you know, uh, we wear PPE, our personal protective equipment. Okay, so it, it's it's relatively obvious, right? I put on gloves on the on, on the route to the call. I'll usually start putting on gloves while driving or sitting in the passenger seat. Now, um, determine the number of patients. So, in a, what's called an NCI or mass casual patient, we have to start figuring out how many patients we have. So, example. If I'm looking at the computer and I know there's five vehicles involved and there's three people ejected in the road, I need more help. Don't send me one ambulance for five people and three people laying in the road that have been ejected, right? Start launching multiple helicopters. Send me multiple ambulances, multiple engine companies, right? So you got to start sending a bunch of help, okay? It's better to ask for too much help and cancel it than get on scene and not have a bunch of help. Uh, probably some of the worst feelings I've had in EMS in my career is getting on scene and not having enough help. Even as an experienced provider, it's very, very, very helpless and stressful when you get there and, you know, I've had, I've literally had that call. I've had two people eject, three people ejected and one person entrapped. And, uh, I'm the only ambulance on scene for the first 20 minutes and it's very stressful. And so you, I started using state troopers and bystanders to help me triage and assess these patients. And, uh, that's what you got to do sometimes. So sometimes you do have to use bystanders. Like law enforcement personnel. I was literally having state troopers help me backboard patients. It was terrible. I was in EUF County. Um, so the primary survey, okay? Primary meaning like the first, el primo, right? Survey. So the goal of the primary survey, test question, uh, is to identify and initiate treatment of immediate or imminent life threats. Okay? So basically this is the one where you walk in and you're like, oh no, they're shooting blood out there from oral artery. We better put on a tourniquet, right? It is... The across the room survey of like, oh no, the patient's cyanotic with a needle sticking out of the arm. This is a heroin overdose. We better do something quickly, right? Address their life threat. So these are life threats, okay? Now, with that said, is chest pain a life threat? Mm, yeah, eventually, but I'm talking airway compromise, circulation compromise, or bleeding, okay? Like true, like they're going to die in the next minute or two if we don't do something, okay? Life threats. Now, in the primary survey, we form our general impression. And generally, our general impression is like our across-the-room survey, right? You really aren't touching the patient at this point, and you're looking, and you're like – and something that comes with experience, and I'm, I'm pretty good at this. And, and So I used to work at Cook Children's, right? And uh, we used to have this guy called the podium medic as the paramedic. So as every patient would come in through the front doors of the uh, ER, I would look at them, hey, what's going on today, right? Oh, they have shortness of breath. Oh, they're – and I would triage them. I would literally give them and their parents a sticker of a green, yellow, or red sticker, or I would take them back to a resuscitation room immediately. And so you have to really quickly be able to tell sick or not sick, sick or not sick. And I would do that a couple hundred times in four hours, right? Just constantly turning and burning on patients. Are you sick or not? And so that comes with time, and you'll work on this. But you – even as a young EMT, right, you're going to walk into a call on your clinical and be like, yo, you don't look good. Right. And that's going to happen. So we form our general impression. And again, we're not really touching the patient at this point. And we're just looking at their appearance and their position. So the patient that's like sitting like this and like twerked out. Right. That's not good. Versus the patient that's, you know, like sitting in their room and they're just like, oh, hey, the ambulance is here. Right. That's two different presentations. One's about to die. One's not. OK. So we can use our intuition and context clues. Right. Generally, someone playing on the phone is not very ill. So, or at least critically ill. Does the patient appear to have a life-threatening condition? Again, bleeding, not breathing, something like that. Was the patient injured? What was their mechanism of injury? So we look around. Oh, wow, there's a 12-foot ladder and a bunch of Christmas lights laying on the ground. They fell off the roof or the ladder, okay? Oh, wow, there's a, there's a half-cut rope and a noose tied around this guy's neck. Oh, he was hanging, okay? You know, like th there's things like that that we that we look for in the mechanism of injury, okay? And, and the caliber of the weapon becomes important too, right? So like someone shooting themselves in the head with a 30-30, seeing that versus a 22 pistol, right? A rifle versus a pistol is going to cause a lot different mechanism of injury to the head, right? Or the chest or wherever they shoot themselves at or get shot. So just know like the caliber of the weapon. How big was the knife? How fast were they traveling? How far did they fall? These are all things that we want to try to gather on scene because guess what? The physicians don't get that. The ER nurses don't get that. We get that for them, okay? Does the patient seem coherent and able to answer questions? Hey, my name's Hunter. I'm a paramedic with the Park County Hospital District, EMS. What's going on today? And they just stare at you, right? Like that's not normal. So you got to think, oh, there, there's a there is some type of neuro event going on right now, right? So 
these are all, you know, and, and the same thing. You walk in the room and someone doesn't immediately look at you, right? You should think something is wrong. Okay. These are all context clues that we're going to have to be using our situational awareness, right? So you want to maintain a high index of suspicion and begin treatment. What's a high index of suspicion, right? Our, so an a index of suspicion is how suspicious are you? Okay. So if we want to be highly suspicious of injury or illness and begin treatment, that's what they're saying. A high index suspicion is saying that we are very suspicious of injury or illness. And we're going to uh, ascertain the gross level of consciousness, also known as LOC, by determining which category best fits your patient. Are they unresponsive? Are they responsive, but they have an altered level of consciousness? Meaning when you speak to them, they speak really slow or speak gibberish or act a little drunk, right? Are they responsive with an unaltered level of consciousness? That would be me right now, right? So sustained unresponsiveness indicates critical respiratory and circulatory and CNS problems. Sure, yeah, it's shock, right? Or whatever's causing this problem. So altered level of consciousness or responsiveness is in a responsive patient may indicate inadequate perfusion, also known as shock, and oxygenation adversely affecting brain function, also known as shock. So medications, right, drugs, alcohol, poisonings, hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, chemical imbalances or neurological conditions, all these can jack, I mean, the, the, the list of conditions is endless that'll jack up the brain and produce altered LOC. Now, we can test re responsive using verbal, tactile, and painful stimul stimuli and orientation. So first off, we just want to talk to the patient. Hello, sir, sir, can you hear me, right? And then we might try a little bit of a back rub or a tap on the shoulder or, you know, trying to shake their hand or a little bit of a shake, right? And that's tactile, that's touch. Tactile means touch. And we might then go into a painful stimulus. And these are reserved and you have to use these responsibly and don't be a jerk about it. But you might have to do a sternum rub, right? So I will take my knuckles and rub them up onto someone's sternum pretty sternly. Uh, see what I did there? Uh, and, and rub on their sternum and try to elicit a pain response. That's uncomfortable uh, to a patient. Some patients can resist that, though. And sometimes you can take, like, a pen and push on the back of a nail pretty hard. I mean, you know, you're not trying to break their finger, but again, you're trying to elicit a pain response, okay? Um, and see if they'll respond. And if they pull away or swat at your hand when you start doing a sternum rub, okay, well, they're at least responding to pain. So those are all things that we can use, okay? Um, uh, ensure the patient's cervical spine is manualized or manually stabilized if there's an indication to establish uh, spinal motion restrictions. Again, we just don't start yanking patients up off the ground. Like if, if they need a C-collar, they need to be backboarded, we do it. So indicators for spinal motion restriction, including trauma with, so this is their opinion on when we start putting a C collar on and a backboard or, or whatever protocol you want to follow, right? So a mechanism of injury that indicates potential for spinal injury. So again, the patient that dove into three feet of shallow water and hit their head, yeah, they need a C collar. They need to be backboarded, right? Pain or tenderness in the neck or spine. Okay. So we could palpate this. Does this hurt? Excuse me. You know, we have a test where we ask the patient, look this way. Look this way, look up, look down. Does any of that hurt? Yes, it hurts. Okay, boom, C collar. Okay. Patient reports pain in the back or neck, paralysis or a neurological complaint. Priapism is the medical word for erection. So if they're pitching a tent in their pants, right, and they have an erection, that is very, in, very indicative of spinal trauma, a really complete transection of the spinal cord. And it's a, that's, that's very major. You won't see this very often. But priapism is a medical word for erection. And so penis erection. And so uh, you, that that is like very big deal if that happens. Now, I will say I've read the literature on this when teaching a class uh, this year, actually. And so basically, I want you to know that priapism isn't necessarily like a, and I'm not trying to be weird or gross here, guys, but priapism is the medical word for erection. But when you see this in neurological complaints, don't expect them to be like in a full on erection. It might be like a partial erection is actually much, 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 much more common than a full, uh, very stiff erection. Okay, granted, we don't assess genitalia very often, but it is worth me pointing that out to you. Alter mental status. The reason that alter mental status intoxication in a Glasgow comma scale less than 14 are sometimes indications for spinal motion restriction is because the patient can't tell you if they're hurting sometimes. So that's why that shows up. A distracting injury. So a distracting injury could be like the guy that fell and has an open femur fracture. Right, so we're going to be very distracted by the open femur fracture, and we might miss something with our neck. So you'll just throw a C collar on them. Uh, difficulty to, or inability to communicate. Again, if someone can't communicate, or they're altered, or they're confused, 
right, then, then they may not be able to adequately justify not putting on a C-collar or spinal motion restrictions. So we use the AVPU scale, right? So are they A? So this com that, this whole AVPU comes from um, these right here. Are they awake and alert? Are they responsive to verbal stimuli, painful stimuli, or are they just unresponsive? AVPU. Now, they're showing you some different ways you can assess pain response. Be careful with these guys. Uh, there is a fine line between assessing pain response and assault and battery. So you, I, I've seen, um, I'll admit it, I've seen some paramedics and firefighters go to the extreme on this. And really physicians and nurses too, actually. I've seen this, in, you see this a lot, um, where people get a little reckless and carried away with this whole pain response thing. There is a fine line between assessing a pain response and assaulting someone. So you can do this. You can assess pain response. That is a standard of care. But just don't, I mean, rule number one, don't be a jerk, okay? So don't be a jerk to patients. Now, she's squeezing on his earlobe, or this lady's earlobe, I'm sorry. Right here, they're pushing on the brow of the eye. It's a little bit painful. Right there, they're pinching the neck. I wouldn't do that one. Again, my, my go-to is the sternum rub. That's what they're showing you right here. That's a sternum rub, okay? Now, I've seen patients fake their way through this and not respond, but guess what? I don't care, okay? If you want to not respond to the to the sternum rub and I think you're faking because I can prove it in another way, that's fine. I don't got to be like, I know you're faking, lady. I'm going to elicit more pain on you so you respond. Who cares? Okay, it's fine. Let them go. Let them do their thing. Um, so assess the airway. We're going to always be alert for signs in, uh, of, of airway obstruction, okay? Remember, airway is very, very important. Without an airway, if your patient has an airway, they, they die, right? So determine if the airway is open and adequate. Um, sorry. Uh, a responsive patient who cannot speak or cry most likely has a severe airway obstruction. I say this all the time. A crying baby is a healthy baby. I love it when they cry. It's music to my ears because they have an open airway. Unresponsive patients should be considered to have uh, – unresponsive patients should be considered to have experienced a traumatic event. I will say that, yeah, for the most part, right? Uh, the unresponsive patient laying in bed, maybe not. But the unresponsive patient in the in, in the floor or in the car or something like that, you, you might have to expect that they've had some type of traumatic event that has le led to them to be unresponsive, okay? So we'll use the jaw thrust maneuver if there's a, a trauma suspected. Um, so typically we'll do like a head tilt chin lift if it's a medical, but if it's we can't we can't tilt someone's head if they have spinal trauma, we're not supposed to. So what we'll do is we'll take, I mean it's hard to do it myself, guys, but you'll take the jaw and lift it up. To try to displace the tongue upwards off of the oral pharynx, and I mean I look stupid doing that, but anyways, I'll show you this in a lab. This is a hallmark of airway management. You'll you'll be very good at this, okay? And so this man, you take someone that's just like <sighs> snoring respirations, and you just lift their jaw up a little bit, and then they're 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 just salito, like it's just perfect. So it's a good thing, uh, very good skill to know. But remember, we do the jaw the, the jaw thrust maneuver in suspected trauma. Because we don't want to do a head tilt chin lift and, and jack up the, the neck. So, and then we're going to, so we've done the airway, right? So now we want to look, is the breathing adequate, right? Does the patient appear to be choking? What's the international sign for choking? This. Is the respiratory center rate too fast or too slow? Are the patient's respirations too shallow or deep? Again, this comes with time to know what does normal breathing look like? And that's why we listen to every patient, okay? This is why we assess every patient's breathing because we need to know what is normal. Okay, is the patient cyanotic? Remember, cyanosis is the bluest tinge of the skin. Do you hear abnormal breath sounds when listening to the lungs? Is the patient moving air in and out of the lungs? Okay, these are all things that we got to figure out. Okay, this is all ways that we assess breathing. What's their work of breathing? How hard are they breathing? Is the rate normal, fast, slow? Is the depth uh, shallow? Is it very deep, right? We see deep respirations and Kuzmal respirations, right? Is the chest rise equal, right? Did they have a spontaneous pneumothorax on one side, right? Or the, is there paradoxical movement of the chest, right? Do we have a flail segment of the chest? So this is why we want to listen to the breath sounds over each segment of the lung, okay? So we'll observe how much effort is required for the patient to breathe. Again, this is called work of breathing. Very important thing to look at. All pa I mean, virtually all patients are breathing, but uh, we can determine how uh, distressed they are based on their work of breathing. This is very important. This is like a very good clinical sign to use. So labor breathing is characterized by a patient's position and concentration on breathing. Are they having to think about breathing? Right. We see this on, in, in emphysema patients. Um, typically, you shouldn't. Right. But if they're having to like 
like really think about their breathing, right? That's, that's increased work of breathing, right? Is there increased effort? Is there increased depth of each breath, right? These are all things that we're looking. So when, when we find these abnormalities in patients, we don't just say they're not breathing good or they're breathing good. Right. So what we do is we use pertinent negatives if they are if they're breathing good. Right. We, we use pertinent negatives. OK. Hey, we don't see any increased work of breathing. No, no retractions. There is no uh, increased effort of breathing. There is no uh, obvious signs of labor, or accessory muscle usage. Right. So what I'm saying is if in my chart, they look good when they breathe. I, I can't say that. Right. That's 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 trash. We don't do that. So what we do say is we chart these things called pertinent negatives. Pertinent meaning it's important to the story and it's it's false. It's negative, right? So it's pertinent to the story to say, well, they are not using accessory muscle usage and they do not have labored breathing and their lung sounds are, let's see, what else? They are not coughing, right? These are all respiratory things that are not happening that tell part of the story. They're pertinent. So that's called a pertinent negative, Okay. And we chart those because they'll cover you in, in, in court and with your medical director or, or the hospital or whoever to say, well, I mean, Hunter said that they weren't labored and that they had, you know, all these things were not happening. Well, then if it's there, that's what happened. OK, so be very careful. Use, you know, I just tell you. OK, so I'm doing my rotations. Right. And a girl the other day uh, assessed a, a, an asthmatic patient that was sleeping and came out and the doctor's like, how are they breathing? And she goes, oh, they're breathing good and slow. And the doctor lost it on her, eviscerated her right there in the hallway. And was like, I need you to use medical words. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're in medical school and you're using words good and slow. So even as EMTs, like we don't use the words good and slow to describe someone's breathing, right? We use words like non-labored, resting peacefully, right? Uh, no accessory muscle usage, no abdominal, be no uh, belly breathing, right? Pertinent negatives, okay? Excuse me. So... And don't get me wrong, I make mistakes in medical school and paramedic medicine all the time. I'm just sharing one example that happened recently, so that's why I'm sharing that. Now, two common positions is the tripod position. We, we, that's that. Uh, I'm pointing. That's that. And then the sniffing position. Remember, when we sniff a candle, right, we'll kind of open up our passages by leaning forward and sniffing the candle. Um, so that's that's how that happens, okay? So uh, the, these are these are signs of respiratory distress, by the way. And, and I'll go a step further. Signs of respiratory distress in the child can include grunting. So the child will be like this. They'll go, <clears throat> right? Very ominous when that happens. They're grunting to try to keep, excuse me, try to keep their uh, increase their peep and keep their uh, airways open. And then the other one is nasal flaring. You'll see their little noses flare when they're breathing. That's not supposed to happen, and when that does happen, especially in a child, that is a sign of respiratory distress, okay, along with everything else I just talked about. So assess circulation. So we assess and palpate the radial uh, artery in resp response to patients. Yeah, I thought that said infants. Yes, remember, our radial artery is on the thumb side, okay, because our radial bone's on the thumb side, um, and we, we assess the radial pulse, right, um, and we palpate the carotid artery in unresponsive patients. Remember, that's right here. And in younger, ch uh, in, in a child younger than one year, we palpate the brachial pulse. So let's find the, the brachial pulse. So the brachial pulse, what you do is you separate the bicep and the tricep and you push just straight in towards the humerus. And I can already feel mine. And so we do this. You can do this in adults. So don't still have brachial pulse. But we don't really feel a radial pulse in children, but we do go for the brachial pulse. And they're actually showing you that right there. Okay, so the best way that I could describe how to do that is fill the separate the bicep from the tricep and push straight towards the humerus. Whoops. So when we fill the pulse, we want to determine if it's you know uh, if if it's present or absent, of course, right? So we could have an absent radial pulse, but a present carotid pulse, especially in the case of hypotension. Okay, they say as a general uh, uh, antidote, right? I think it's kind of nonsense, but. Um, Generally, if someone has a radial pulse, as a generality, their systolic blood pressure, the top number, is greater than 80. Generally, okay? So that is a general rule that, that has some value, but don't, don't take it to the bank and cash the check. It's not that good. Now, the carotid pulse, you know, that's going to be one of the last ones to go, that and the femoral pulse. Why? And think about this, right? The diameter of the carotid pulse is much larger than the diameter of the radial pulse. And the carotid pulse is going to the brain. So, um, Basically, we, we want to figure out, is the pulse weak, or is it thready, or is it bounding? So what's a thready pulse, right? That's kind of like the, the pulse is weak. It's just thready, 
right? I don't know how to describe the word thready, but a bounding pulse is like boom, 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 right? That's a bounding pulse, okay? So sometimes we use those words to be like, oh, they have a radial pulse, but it's thready, okay? Or it's bounding, you know, like that probably means they're hypertensive or in fluid overload or something. Uh, if you cannot palpate a pulse in an unresponsive patient, you begin CPR. So I, I love this. Well, you'll see this on an exam or a quiz. What they'll do is they'll give you a patient and say, they're breathing six times a minute, but you cannot palpate a pulse. What's your next most appropriate action on an adult? Start CPR. If the vignette tells you you cannot feel a pulse, the answer is CPR. Okay? I'll say that again. If the vignette says, 18-year-old male involved in a car wreck, he's breathing eight times a minute, but you cannot palpate a pulse, what do you do? You start CPR, okay? You don't mess with the airway and stuff. You start CPR. That's the answer. Eventually, you're going to do the airway, of course, but uh, just be aware. Sometimes they'll trick you and they'll say, oh, the patient's breathing eight times a minute, four times a minute. They're gasping for air, whatever they want to tell you. That, that doesn't matter, okay? If you cannot feel a pulse, you start CPR. And, 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 and I guarantee you someone watching this video is going to get slammed on a test question on that because they, they will, they're very tricky on it. They'll say... You know, like the patient's breathing eight times a minute and you're like, what? They're breathing. We don't do CPR in people breathing. No, they're not breathing effectively. And those are agonal respirations. Okay. If the patient and, and agonal respirations are not actual respirations. So if the patient has a pulse, but is not breathing, provide ventilations. Uh, if the patient has a pulse, right? So you can have a pulse, but not be breathing. Granted, it's not going to be happening very long, but then we would ventilate with our BVM. Okay. Now assess circulation. So you're going to assess the skin for uh for for circulation so perfusion we can use capillary refill which we've talked about this this is where you push on the thumbnail and it'll blanch white and quickly go back to red what's happening when i do that i'm forcing the blood out of the capillaries and it's momentarily white because i've pushed all the blood out of the capillaries but since i have good perfusion meaning there's good blood coming down to those capillary beds it's very quickly going to go back to nice and pink because i have good perfusion right there's a large amount of blood being dropped off at, at the capillary bed for it to perfuse the cells so that's that's what's that's what we're assessing now with that capillary refill can be done in multiple places it should be done on the on the fingertips okay but it can also be done here on the extremity right so right here right i'm just going to push on my arm right? Kind of turns white and goes back to its normal color. And then it can also be done on the thorax or in the abdomen. I do both. I'll just take my finger, push down on their chest, let go. Oh, it's less than two seconds. So capillary refill should be less than two seconds. Same thing with the abdomen. Why am I telling you this? Because if the patient's cold, their cap refill, their capillary refill in their extremities will be delayed compared to their central. Same thing if they're in shock, right? You're going to see a delayed peripheral capillary refill compared to a quicker uh, central capillary refill. And sometimes that difference is clinically relevant, right? So if the cap refill is eight seconds, it's supposed to be less than two seconds, uh, on the, the pointer finger, but it's six seconds on the arm and it's four seconds on the extremity, I might think, mm, they're cold. It's cold outside, right? Because when we're cold, we shunt blood to our core away from our periphery. Same thing happens in shock too. We will shunt blood. So just be aware of that. But cap refill is a very good tool. Skin temperature, the moisture. Do they have diaphoresis? Are they dry? Are they hot, right? Uh, what's the color of the skin? Is, do they have a gray color? Are they cyanotic? Are they blue? Are they purple? Are they are they yellow? Are they jaundiced, right? There's all these different schools or uh, schools of thought and in, in, in ways that we're going to use to assess circulation, okay? This is acrocyanosis right here. Um, notice the baby has a little bit of a bluish tint here and here and on their hands. That's called acrocyanosis. We really use that term mostly in infants and pediatrics, but you can use it on adults too. Typically you'll see uh, uh, cyanosis first around the mouth, okay? So, uh, and then in the extremities as well. So we use this in the APGAR scoring, which we'll talk about in OB. But inadequate peripheral circulation will change the appearance of the skin, right? So liver disease can cause dysfunction and it may uh, cause jaundice. Jaundice is the yellowish tint of the skin. If you've ever seen someone with liver disease, like cirrhosis, like an alcoholic, or someone with hepatitis, you, I mean, it's very obvious. Like, it is like yellow skin. Now, I will say, what if someone's black, right? What if they have black skin? It becomes really difficult to tell if a black person has a yellow tint. So what we do is we look in the eye. We look in the wide of the eye, the sclera, right? It's the white part of my eye is called the sclera. And so sometimes we can get this thing called scleral icterus, right? Which is jaundice of the eye. So basically what I'm telling you is you'll see jaundice first in the eye. 
So it doesn't matter the color of the skin, black, brown, you know, white. Uh, you'll see jaundice in the eye. So that's a good place to look, and it's called scleral icterus. And uh, we'll talk about what jaundice is later, but it's an increase of bilirubin. room. It's usually almost always related to uh, liver issues, almost always. So skin temperature, so is the skin hot, cold, clammy, right? Cool, pale, clammy skin, this is important. Cool, pale, clammy skin is a sign of shock, also known as hypoperfusion. The skin moisture, so, you know, if it's 110 degrees outside and the skin's dry, that's a problem, right? Now, if it's 62 degrees outside and the skin is soaking wet with sweat, that's also a problem. So we have to use our intuition and our context clues of, of, of the environment to, to figure out, is this normal? You know, that's cap refill time. I just talked about that. Okay. So you want to assess and control external bleeding, identify and immediately control any major external bleeding. Should be performed before addressing airway and breathing. Uh, yeah. So let me say this. We fix circuit. So the whole ABC thing, it's dead and gone in the words TI, right? It goes circulation, airway, breathing now. Okay. So if someone is not doesn't have a pulse, we start CPR immediately, okay? We don't care about the airway at first. We start CPR, we start chest compressions. The same thing can be said with bleeding out, okay? It, 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 uh, I want you to know that if someone is shooting blood across the room, we have to fix that first, okay? So, you know, and that's part of the circulation, okay? So we start CPR if there is no pulse. What if they're gasping? We start CPR if there is no pulse. So we assess for disability. So we'll perform a brief neurological exam. And uh, uh, determine the patient's normal mental status. So how I'll do this is I'll ask the family or the nursing home staff or someone, you know, are, is she behaving normally to you? Because the 88-year-old female who's been in a nursing home for 20 years may not know the president or the date or, you know, all these, you know, uh, the the alert and oriented questions right so th that 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 may be their normal okay but they may say no 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 she always knows my name i'm her caregiver i have been for five years and she doesn't even know my name right now that's not normal that's a sudden change oh okay right so that's that's worth knowing and so we can use those things clinically to help us uh to ask okay well you know, does she normally not know what today is? Does she normally not know her date of birth? Does she normally not know what her daughter's name is, right? And and, and we look in, in deviation from the normal, okay? So what I'm saying is realize that their normal may not be what you think normal is. So we ask caregivers when we can, and those who know the patient well, well, is this normal? You know, it may not be. So, so we use this thing called person, place, time, and event, right? So the person is, uh, you know, can you tell me your name, right? What's your date of birth? Place, where are you right now? Oh, I'm at home. I'm in the back of an ambulance, right? Where, where, where do you live? What's your address, right? So I could push it a little further. Oh, I live in Weatherford, you know, or whatever. Okay, well, what's what's the time? Oh, well, today, and see, like, I'm not having to look at my watch, right? It's November 24th at 3.30, right? And so, 2023. And so, it wouldn't be like that big of a deal for someone to not know the, the date, right? And so, sometimes they don't, and I'll just ask, okay, well, what month are we in? Oh, we're November. Or they don't know, and I'm like, well, what holidays did we just celebrate, right? Today's the day after Thanksgiving. Oh, well, Thanksgiving, you know. So if they tell me Easter, they're way off. They're back in April, you know what I'm saying? So I'll use things like that and kind of work my way back sometimes on the date and event. Well, what's going on today? I have no clue why you're here, right? And they're the one that called 911. So, you know, we can use all these things. An event, too, they'll use uh, who's the president of the United States. I, I, I tend to not like this question. It pisses patients off, one, two. Um, Dude, Barack Obama was the president for eight years. George Bush is the president for eight years. Trump is the president for four years. Is that really telling you the current event? No, not really. You know, so I tend to not use that um, very often. Or if I do, I'll start with that and work a little deeper. So just be aware, people use the president as an event. I think that's a stupid question because, uh, I mean, dude, like it's an eight-year term. Is that really telling you the current event? So anyways, uh, as you determine the patient's formal baseline, right? So an assess for disability. So you want to do an orientation test, uh, a patient's mental status, right? So the memory and their thinking ability. Really, you can pick up on this pretty quickly just by talking to a patient, you know. 
oh, they're with it. They know what's going on. They know why I'm here. They know what I'm about to do to them, like to pick them up, put them on the stretcher, take them to the hospital, right? They know where their medications are located. They know what medicines are taken by name. You know, those are all things we could use to try, kind of assess their, their thinking ability. Now, the GCS or the Glasgow Coma Scale, we've covered this. This was originally designed to assess uh, injury after a coma, and we've turned it into something it was never designed for, but nonetheless, here we are talking about it. So it assessed the eye, uh, uh, eye verbal, and motor response, right? And so a maximum score of 15 and a low score of 3. You know, 3 is someone who's dead. A 15 is me talking to you right now. A 14 is someone who's confused. So... It's a really, I, I, it's not a great scale, but it is used, and you absolutely have to know it. Okay, you have to know the GCS scale, and you have to be able to do it blind, right? So I have to, I, I'm going to give you a vignette on a test, right? And you're going to have to know, know, oh, you know, they withdraw from pain, they're confused, and they open up their eyes to verbal stimulus. What's their score? You know, so that's going to come up on a test. So you want to expose and cover. Guys, you got to be careful with this. You know, you don't need to rip someone's clothes off in the middle of Walmart in the deli section, right? This might be something we do in the back of the ambulance. We might ask the, the neighbor or bystanders or the young child, child or something, you know, to step out, right? You want to have a chaperone when possible, but we do need to expose the patient most times to assess the patient, especially their chest for like work of breathing and stuff. Um, but just expose what you have to expose. So you don't have to completely get them butt naked and take a look and then cover them, right? You could do this in, in sections, right? So I might, you know, take off their shirt, right? Take a look and then cover them up. I might, you know, lift up the pants, take a look. I mean, this is rare to look at the genitalia, but just quickly look at the genitalia, cover it, right? Pull up a pant leg, take a look. You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying you don't have to get them completely naked at once, but you may have to assess the whole body. In, in, in sections, okay? Use a chaperone where possible. Be aware that uh, assault and battery is still a thing when doing that. Uh, so it has to be done professionally, you know, so just be smart. Now, performing, and, and the patient can refuse it at any point, okay? And I always ask for consent if you can, right? So, hey, I need to look at your chest. I need to see at your work of breathing and see how your chest is moving. Is that okay, right? You're asking permission. And I've had patients tell me no, and that's fine. That's the right, okay? So, okay, no problem. That's okay. So perform a full body rapid scan helps us identify other injuries, right? So we inspect, right, with our eyes, we palpate with our hands, and we auscultate with our ears, okay? And we use the mnemonic DCAP BTLS, and the book tells you what this is, but this is deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetration, pain, I don't know. Tell me what P is in the comments, just kidding. Burns trauma, uh... God, guys, I forgot what DCAP BTLS is. Okay, well, homework, right? <laughs> Burns trauma. Is it lesions? I don't know. Wow, okay, I'm not redoing this video. So there you go. Look it up. So uh, identify and treat life uh, treat life threats. I'm still stuck on the DCAP BTLS. I can't believe I forgot that. Deformities, contusions, abrasions, puncture wounds maybe. Burns, tenderness lacerations I don't know what the S stands for anyways got me so quickly address life threats recognize signs and symptoms um, and so <clears throat> you have to realize that sometimes these patients will be very anxious okay again we don't tell them calm down we work through it we work through their anxiety with them and try to help them and coach them right they, they could have uh, loss of meaning, meaningful communication, loss of consciousness, unresponsive to external stimuli, right? So to pain, verbal, or uh, uh, tactile stimulation. Uh, so the muscles become slack. So they'll relax. Like when someone's dying, right, uh, their muscles become slack. Right? If they're like deeply unconscious, uh, their muscles can become slack. And the tongue can sag into the back of the throat. So what's the co most common airway obstruction is the tongue, okay? Um, and so we'll identify and treat life threats, right? Only a few, dish, few conditions really will cause it, like true sudden death. Airway obstruction would be one of them. Respiratory arrest or respiratory failure. Cardiac arrest. True shock. Severe bleeding, right? Those are the ones that will kill you very, very rapidly. And so we begin with assessment of the ABCDEs, right? And we control life. Oh, so look, I'm telling you, it's going to show up. So we control life-threatening bleeding takes priority over airway and breathing concerns. So look, what they'll do, guy's in a car wreck, he has life-threatening bleeding from his right arm, but he's breathing two times a minute. 
what do you do first? You apply a tourniquet. Okay. And I know that's weird. Okay. But you apply a tourniquet. You stop the bleeding. We stop the bleeding. And then we go on. So in the vignette, if they give you life-threatening bleeding, I don't care how they describe it, you know, bleeding from the leg, bleeding from the mouth or whatever. We have to stop the bleeding first or the neck. You stop the bleeding and then you go on. They're going to get you on that. So watch for that. Now, determine priority uh, of patient care and transport. So a rapid full body scan, you know, so real quick, you know, scan can help you determine a transport priority. You know, sometimes in the military, they'll do what's called a blood sweep where they'll just take clean gloves and run their hands over the body. And if their gloves come back bloody, right, it's like, oh, they're, they're, they're bleeding somewhere, right? And so we can use that sometimes. Of course, the high priority patients, the ones that are dying right now, need a hospital right now, will be transported immediately. The pay, uh, will protect the patient's spine and identify fractured extremities, okay? Yeah, of course. Now, there's this thing called the golden hour. The, the research doesn't support this as much as your book thinks, but we'll talk about it. The golden hour basically says we want, and this is, this part's intuitive, right? It's true, but the whole hour thing and the, the amount of mortality and morbidity that's reduced, that part's in question. But what it says is that, um, let's just start here at, at the zero hour. Okay. So you start here in the first 20 minutes, this is discovery of the incident and activation of the EMS system. Okay. And then, so we, we got to get calls. We got to get to the scene, right? The platinum 10 minutes, so this is basically where we do our initial assessment, we do our intervention, and we package the patient. So for trauma patients, we want to be on scene less than 10 minutes, and, and stroke patients too. But for real life-threatening emergencies, you want, from the time you check on scene to the time your wheels are turning, should be less than 10 minutes. If you think that's long, it's not. That's a lot of things that have to happen, okay? Now, I've had scene times in, in the 90-second range before where we're just throwing them in the back and we're going. Sometimes that happens, Okay. And then we're going to transport them to the initial hospital and we're going to uh, stabilize and route. So just realize, especially at the EMT level, like there's not a lot you can't do in the back of a moving ambulance to where sometimes it's best just to uh, scoop and go, right? Like we're going to throw them in the back and let's just start going to the hospital. I think we lose track of it, especially at the paramedic level, but even at the EMT level that we're in the business of taking patients to the hospital. So load them up and go to the hospital. People, I've seen this. I've, I've been a part of this where you get caught in this death spiral of trying to start IVs and, and do breathing treatments and put on this and wound pack that and put on a traction splint. It's like, dude, we've been on scene 45 minutes. Let's go. And, and so just be aware of that. Now we'll stop here. We'll do part two. Uh, part two is a little bit more of like history taking and stuff like that. So yeah, thanks for your time.